Good evening, everybody. We are going to start in just a moment, uh, so please hang tight. We'll be starting the program in just a couple of minutes. Thanks so much for being here. We've got a hell of a show tonight.
Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening and happy Story Fest 2021. I'm Alex Giannini, the Associate Director of Programs here at the Westport Library. Uh, and for those of you new to the festival, I'm gonna give you a real quick backstory before we get started. Like all good ideas, Story Fest was born in a coffee shop. Wouldn't it be cool if we brought back a literary festival to Westport? That initial seed grew with the help of equally enthusiastic partners and friends, and was born out of that most basic of library tenants, access for all. Wouldn't it be cool if we could introduce our community, young and old and everyone in between, to writers from across all genres? Wouldn't it be cool if we could send some of those writers out into the schools in Westport and Bridgeport and in Norwalk to talk to students in their own classrooms? Wouldn't it be cool if we could get students from all over the state to meet writers like R.L. Stein and Jason Reynolds and Nick Stone? Wouldn't it be cool if Joe Iconis performed at Tokay Hall or Sam Weller brought Ray Bradbury back to life or Kate Howells took us on a, deep, uh, on a voyage to deep space? This year marks the fourth annual Story Fest. That in itself seems crazy. What's crazier though is that we keep inviting people and they keep saying yes. Wouldn't it be cool if New York Times best-selling author of The Only Good Indians and My Heart is a Chainsaw, Stephen Graham Jones, stepped into the ring to do battle in a horror off against New York Times best-selling author of The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires and The Final Girl Support Group, Grady Hendrix. Wouldn't it be cool? So please join me in welcoming two of our favorite writers and, more importantly, two of our very favorite people. So give it up for Grady Hendrix. And Stephen Graham Jones. I decided to dress as a victim for Halloween in every sense of the word. <laughs> you look great, man. Thank you, thank you. Uh, people in the first row, you're going to get a treat. <laughs> debates in horror, a lot of preferences, but as we all know with preferences, there is always one right answer. So tonight, we're going to settle all of them. Yeah. All of them. Pretty much all of them. Pretty much all of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. Settle. So let's go. Let's do this. We're ready. Where's that first slide? Ah, round one, question versus question. Let's, let's dive in. Michael versus Freddy versus Jason. Steven? I will go with Jason. I like Jason because his, his mission is righteous. I don't think Freddy's is righteous. I don't think Michael's is righteous. I think they just like to kill. But Jason has a beef with camp counselors. They killed his mother. And that's a good reason to go on a 50-year-long, you know, killing spree. Well, I feel like that's one of the flaws with Jason, right? Like, by the time you get to... Jason, part eight, Jason takes, man, yeah, you know, yeah. you're, he's lost his way. Like that, yeah. he's killed everyone he needs to kill. He has, he's going well outside his, his purview. Yeah. yeah, and he also, even by three, he's killing campers and yeah. um, uh, biker gangs. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is, which yeah. I, they never did anything to him. <laughs> who do you go with? So, it's more an issue of who do I not go with? Like, mm -hmm. Michael Myers, I don't know, humorless, humorless, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, slow moving, probably slow talking. He's probably one of those people who you go out to dinner and he's still like a third of the way through his meal and everyone else is done and you all have to sit there for a really long time. Yeah, how does he get food through his mask? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> that too. Um, and I, and he's, he's pretty, Freddy talks too much mm -hmm. and he's kind of like a bad touch uncle. Like he's always got shtick, he's, he's a pedophile. Yeah. So, you know, who wants to hang out with a pedophile? So I'm gonna go with Jason. I'm all gonna right. go with Jason also. All so right. laid to rest, Jason's best. Definitely. All right. Definitely, what's next? What's next? Sexy vampires versus gross vampires. What do you want? So, all right. Both, both are the same thing. Because both of them are diseases, right? Yeah. Like, like, vampires are all about disease. And so, like, sexy vampires are the whole thing of, like, you don't know what disease 
the dude you're with has. He could have any sexually transmitted disease at all. And in fact, when they made Dracula in 1931, that was the whole big fear of not only the America, but the producer of the movie, Carl Limley Jr. He actually would line his underwear with like sanitary pads because he didn't want like sexually transmitted diseases to jump from like a chair to his junk. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. So then you have Dracula, who's like the older man, yeah. you know, he's sort of seductive, he bites Mina, he gives her a disease that makes her dirty, she says. On the other hand, you got the gross vampires, Nosferatu and all that, um, who are also just gross. They travel with rats, they're diseased. So it's two diseases. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Who are you going to go with? You know, I think I've finally come down. You've got a vampire with like these insect legs that come out of the mouth. Well, it's yeah. like a proboscis. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't yeah. suck anything with fangs. Fangs yeah. are for shooting something into something, not for sucking out. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, a butterfly proboscis, that's how you suck, but I didn't want to give them a big butterfly thing on the yeah. front of his face. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I would finally land on gross vampires because the hunting tactics are different. Sexy vampires seduce you. Gross vampires wait in the parking lot and jump on you, and that's more exciting to me. Yeah, no, I can see it. I'm going to go with sexy vampires, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm going to make the case that if you're writing a book, gross vampires generally have to live in like a disgusting basement or yeah. an attic. A sexy yeah. vampire can interact with people. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. more fun to write. It is. There's a lot more fun with wordplay and double entendres and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't drink <laughs> the, uh, wine. Uh, so yeah, I'm going with sexy. Yeah. You're going with gross. Yeah. Yeah. Unresolved. Unresolved. Let's do a show of hands. Where, who's, who, if you guys, sexy vampires? Ooh, okay, that's a fair amount. Uh, gross vampires. Ooh, the sexy wins. Sexy edges out. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I feel like I'm on the winning side here. All right. But Next. sexy vampires are twilight vampires, too. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. So much hate for twilight. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I feel, I, feel, I feel like someone needs to defend twilight. I read, twi- I read all those books. I read them because one of my neighbors timidly brought it over while I was outside because he said, I hear you write books. Here's a book. And there was a weird, weird, like, entry. But um, That's an awkward interaction. It was very yeah. awkward. And, but it was Twilight, and I thought, I'll read it because I want to not be enemies with my neighbor. And the next time I looked up, like, three days later, I'd read all four books. You know? Yeah. Because I had to see if Bella and Edward got together. Right? I read the first two, but I didn't read the... Because it's five, right? Yeah, I think they've four got to be... There's four in the first place. There might be a fifth. There's four, I think. Yeah, yeah I read two, but not the other two. But also, I like their mm-hmm. werewolves in it. Like... The werewolves in it are smart. Before they transform, they put their clothes into a little pouch and they tie it to their leg and then they transform into a wolf so they run around with their clothes on their feet. And then so when they transform back, they're not naked. They can just dress up again. Which actually makes a lot of sense. Because I feel like if you were a werewolf, like your clothing allowance is huge. I know. People can always figure out who you are because you're the guy naked in the corner. Yeah, yeah, the guy naked in the corner who's wearing like a little bit of like purple cutoff or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Next, okay, we're yeah. on British horror versus American horror. Ah, well, All right, what about Stephen. You? No, you. I gotta go first. Um, I, is this still working? It's still working. Yeah. All right. I thought I messed it up. Um, I'm gonna go with American horror because American horror gets to the blood quicker. I feel like I think British horror does a lot more with suggestion and atmosphere, typically. So, in American horror, I mean. America, the Americas, anyways, are where zombies are kind of from. And I like zombies. It's fair. Yeah, yeah I would say zombies are from America. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with British horror. And I was, I'm not just doing this to be contradictory. I'm going to make the case, and then we'll do a show of hands. Uh, and then you can make a counter case mm-hmm. if you want. But so a lot of people feel like America invented like jazz and the blues and westerns, um, but England invented horror. And you look at there, you've got Mary Shelley, you've got all that stuff, Bram Stoker and all that. But also, England has something that we don't have over here, besides rainy castles and, and gloomy gothic shit. They also have folk horror. You know, that, that, that feeling that, you know, the land is haunted and the fields, the furrows, and the wicker man, and these old druid traditions of human sacrifice that, you know, keep, keep things coming up. In folk horror in the States, we've got Harvest Home, the Thomas Tryon novel from the 70s, and Children of the Corn, and then not a whole lot beyond that, but I'm a sucker for it. And England, it's probably because we're a newer country. They've got hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and you know, it's standing stones that move when you're not looking at them, and uh, cults and small villages that practice human sacrifice for the corn. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with, and also, I spent about a year and a half in England when I was a kid, and it was in the 70s, so everything was brown and made of corduroy. 
Um, England was very gloomy in the 70s. Um, and I remember they had bathrooms in the subway stations, the tube stations, um, and the toilet paper in them was wax paper. Um, and it didn't work. It was awful. It was actually painful and, and, and sadistic. Um, but that was sort of what England was at the time. And every, all the food tasted like cardboard, and I loved it. I was like seven years old. And TV was great because they had all these messed up shows. Um, Doctor Who was always like getting really gothic and weird. There was a show called Sapphire and Steel. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this. Like, it's basically like these people hunting these these terrible BBC special effects that were just flashlight beams, but they were like phantoms. But all the plots are like people getting sucked into pictures. And I remember at the end, Sapphire and Steel, our heroes, are going to investigate probably someone getting sucked into a picture, and they stop to have tea at this really depressing tea shack on the side of the road. And then all of a sudden, like one of them's like, oh no. And they go and open the door, and there's nothing outside but like darkness. It's like they're in the void of space. And like the bad guys have tricked them into this like tea shop trap. And now they're stuck here for eternity. And that's the end of the series. They're stuck in this depressing tea shop forever. Um, Blake Seven was another big one that was like a sci-fi show for kids. And it was like sort of Star Wars, you know, a crew of rebels and an empire. And in the last episode of that, after two seasons, the hero, Blake, who was like the, the Han Solo character, it turns out he'd been a plant for the evil empire the whole time getting all these rebels together, and then they just murder them all in a massacre in the last episode. So like, there was something really depressing and grim about it. I appreciate it. So I'm going to go for British horror. All right. You know, it makes sense. I don't have a taste for folk horror, so it makes sense that I wouldn't go for British horror. If British That's horror is like their DNA is fused together. The only, I think the only folk horror thing I can think of that I've really bit on is... Liz Hand's Wilding Hall, which is an amazing... Which is great. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing book. She does it so well. But, um, yeah, in, you're right. In the Americas, almost every story wants to be a uh, haunted Indian burial ground thing, you know, which is I know. insulting in a variety of ways, of course. Um, and that's probably why I resist the folk impulse in American stuff, too. Well, and that is the folk horror impulse in America. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I've read a lot of those books when mm -hmm. I was doing the same paperbacks for hell about all these, the horror paperback boom in the 70s, 80s. And none of them are written by anyone who's Native American. Yeah. It's all white people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. hardly a big surprise. But, yeah, yeah and, and it's, it, they always do this thing because they don't want to insult, usually, any actual real tribe. So it's like, well, this is an earlier tribe mm -hmm. that, that everyone hated. Even, like, you know, and it's just like, yeah. really? That, I don't know. It, that's really yeah. a hand wave there. Yeah. Um, so you're just going for American? I'm American. I'm going for British. Let's do a show of hands for American. Uh, oh, and the clap. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see for British. Yeah, I think American. Oh, more clapping, but fewer yeah. hands. Yeah. You know what? You people are quality people. <laughs> Uh, those British horror fans. All right, let's do the next question. The Shining, book versus movie. Well, if Stephen King was here, we'd know which he'd pick. We do. He would pick the book, of course. Yeah. Um, and I guess we have to specify which movie. Oh, well, definitely not the miniseries. <laughs> um, I picked the book. I mean, I, lo I love the, the movie, but I love that movement at the end of the Stephen King novel where Dick Halloran has a moment that he almost commits violence against Danny. Like, the horror goes over, the big spirit like comes out of the window of The Shining, but then there's a moment where Holler Halloran can do something to Danny, and that's like an extra step. I think horror has to always take that extra step, and the I'm, novel does. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, and I actually like the uh, topiary animals more yeah. than I like the maze a little so bit. I, yeah. But I'm going to go for the movie, and yeah. simply because the book's good, I've seen that movie so many times. And for me as a kid, we're going to talk about my childhood a lot tonight. But for me as a kid, I remember sitting behind my uncle because it came on network TV. And so I would sneak out of bed and stand behind him and watch it until my, my great aunt would like chase me out of the room. And he was, he, was, he was chewing tobacco and spitting in his styrofoam cup. And he was putting it like, he didn't know I was there. So he was putting it right like on me practically. So I had a big styrofoam cup full of spit, the tobacco juice. And I was watching The Shining, and I was like eight years old, and it really imprinted on me hard. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Bible camp, because that's what I did, and um, the first, it was like a week later, and the first night of Bible camp, you go around, you're introducing yourself, and this kid in my cabin 
freaks out. And he's like, I'm not sleeping with him. He's, no. And he's like crying and screaming, going really upset. And because he'd just seen The Shining on TV. And the caretaker who murders his daughter is named Grady. So he doesn't want to be in the cabin with me. And instead of telling this kid, like slapping him, which I think is, I don't have kids, but I assume that's what you do. You slap them um, if they get upset. And, um, and, and if they don't, then you backhand them on the way back. And instead of doing that with this kid, they all treated me like the enemy. And wow. I had to go sleep in the big kid's cabin. And they wanted nothing to do with me. Wow. And so in protest, I refused to shower or change my clothes for the entire week of Bible camp. So The Shining movie is a big deal for me in the way yeah. the book isn't. We know the what I love about the Shining movie is those opening aerial shots, like where yeah. they're on the road and the, the oh, it's on a plane. Oh, um, those oh, are up on the Blackfeet Reservation, so it always feels oh, are like, they really? it always feels like going home when I see that. Oh, that's shot. awesome! Yeah. Wait, so you know that territory, yeah. like that land? Yeah. Oh wow, because yeah. it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, is that road? Did the mountain stuffs in there too? Yeah, yeah. That that road yeah. is that road goes into the park into Glacier Park. And that windy Carlos music. <laughs> yeah, that's always playing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, okay, book, movie. All right, show of hands for the book. Oh, man. Show of hands for the movie. Mm, uh, I don't know. Pretty Steven? close. Yeah, we'll call that a tie. The movie. All right, <laughs> next question. Oh, Craven, Wes Craven versus John Carpenter. Oh, man. I know where I'm coming down. So this isn't my yeah favorite. yeah same place I am. This isn't favorite. This is most influential. Most influential. Most influential. I would probably say Carpenter most influential because he started the golden age of the slasher with Halloween, and then Craven, Craven was part of that golden age. But yeah, I would ha I would say Carpenter laid down bigger footprints that everybody else walked in finally. Wow, I I, I thought we were friends, man. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's Carpenter. Last House on the Left. Wait, no. No, sorry, Craven, oh, Craven. Okay. Jesus Christ. You like, <laughs> we made eye contact and you totally mess with my head. Um, Craven, because he's got uh, one, two, three iconic ones. Nightmare on Elm Street, Last House on the Left, which was, you know, uh, real, I mean, it wasn't a slasher, but it was right there at the beginning, mm -hmm. right around Texas Chainsaw Massacre yep. for an atrocity movie. Yep. Nightmare on Elm Street, so three. Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Last House on the Left, Scream. and uh, Scream. 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 And then, in amongst that, he made a lot of really great movies out there. People mm -hmm. Under the Stairs, Scream 2, I still think is a good movie till the very end. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I gotta go with Craven, man. Serpent in the Rainbow is actually a pretty good movie. Like, it is. Yeah. I, I don't know, I, I, gotta, I yeah. gotta do Craven. Yeah, if I were doing Favorite, I'd say Craven. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh see, if I was doing a Favorite, I'd say Carpenter. <laughs> um, I can watch The Thing till the cows come home. Yeah. And uh, unlike yeah. you, I love The Fog. Yeah. I know, you don't like The Fog. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <sighs> I grew up in West Texas. Yeah, you're like, what is all this seaside stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see. Carpenter? That's a pretty Ooh, small showing. It is. All right, is. Craven. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, uh, a, I'm going to... Maybe Tide, I don't know. Jesus, Tide. We're not settling anything. I know. <laughs> all right, next question. Werewolves, two-legged versus four-legged. You first. I think we're going to agree on this. Yeah, I think so. Uh, four-legged. Four-legged for me, too. Four-legged makes sense as an animal, as a biological beast. Yeah. Two-legged, it's like if you've got a wolf head and wolf hands, then in a human body, it seems like you're going to be a worse hunter than you would if you were a pure, pure person or a pure wolf, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Also, two of the best werewolf movies, mm -hmm. uh, American Werewolf in London and Ginger Snaps, are both four-legged yeah. werewolves. Yeah. Um, I would say, I think a lot of the medieval werewolves mm -hmm. were four-legged. They were. And I feel like, I feel like, this is my feeling, if you were a guy and you turn into a four-legged wolf, mm -hmm. you were a werewolf, you've turned into a, wer a wolf. Mm -hmm. If I'm a guy and I turn into a two-legged thing, mm -hmm. I'm just a hairy man with yeah. anger management problems. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. like how am I a wolf? I agree. Yeah. I, I've gone through puberty really quickly yeah. and yeah. I'm angry. Like, you, got, you got mutton chops. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, all right. Two-legged versus four-legged. Two-legged? Three. Yeah, okay. Four-legged. Yeah, all right. All right. All right. Laid to rest. Yeah. Four-legged. Two-legged. Yeah. Go make some other. Don't call yourself a werewolf. <laughs> all right. Next question. Dario Argento versus Lucio Fulci. Oh, that's hard. Mario, Is it? Really? Can I pick Mario Baba, man? You can. <laughs> you can go outside the box. Yeah, no, I'll go with... Um, um, I'll go with Argento. Argento. Argento, really? Yeah, yeah I like his, his palettes. And I, li I like that he is addicted to crane, crane shots. You know, those slow, like, we're going to look at this for three minutes and go across. I like that kind of work. 
But are you going to reveal your dark secret? No, that I'm, I'm not as big of a fan of Suspiria as the rest of the world. That's my dark secret. Um, I, for Argento, it's probably opera for me is my favorite. Yeah, opera's, opera's great. Yeah. Opera's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do that at the end of every time I do a public appearance. I just <laughs> fall on the stage, gripping. The, I run outside and grip the dirt <laughs> and I just rub it on my face. Um, so for me, it's Fulci all the way. I love Suspiria. If it's ever screening, I'll go and see it. But Fulci, it's dirtier. It's grimier. I feel like Fulci hates humanity and decided to make movies as a way to hurt it. And also, when I was a child, um, I, I was, at, I was with a, hanging out with a friend. We were 13, or I think we were 14. And uh, my friend Aaron Berg, and we weren't really friends. We were, like, he was a part of the group of friends, but we weren't friends in that group of friends. And Aaron was a little cooler than I was. Um, but we were hanging out together. And we were like, oh, you want to watch a movie? Sure. So we go to the video store. We're looking around. And he's like, what about this? And it was uh, Lucio Fulci, City of the Dead. Uh, City of the Living Dead, and I think it was the Gates of Hell version, you know, the title. So I'm like, I don't know, sure. So we get it. It's filmed in Savannah, Georgia, and I still like to imagine this crew of weird Italians getting people to puke guts and stuff on the streets of Savannah while people walk around and go, who are these fellas over here? Um, so we watch this thing. It has this traumatic scene where a woman vomits up her intestines, lots of maggots flying around. I mean, it's, a, it's an upsetting movie. Even today, it's an upsetting movie. We get to school the next day, People say, oh, you guys are hanging out. What'd you do? And Aaron goes, Grady made me watch the most messed up movie, man. It was I, It's not even good. It was just messed up. And then for the rest of the week, everyone's looking at me like I was messed up. So I doubled down. I'm going to go, also, Fulci has yeah. a scene where in zombie where a zombie fights a shark. That's the best scene that, of all. That's, that may be the best scene in all it, of horror it's, cinema. It's not a claymation shark. It's a real shark. It is a, a shark, a yeah. A real person under real water. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm, so I'm all in for Fulci. Yeah. So... Argento, let's see a show of hands. Nobody. Oh, two, two over here. Okay, yeah. Fulci. Oh, whoa, Fulci. all right, Fulci it is. Maybe you converted them. Maybe. Or it could be zombie versus shark. <laughs> yeah, it could Hard be. Hard to top that. All right, be. next question. Yeah. Who's scarier, ghosts versus zombies? Oh, this is easy. You zombies. Go. Really? Yeah, ghosts aren't scary. Ghosts can startle you when you come around the corner at two in the morning, but all, all a ghost can do is tell you, um, I was murdered in the basement, or your grandma did this, or whatever. That's, which is, I mean, you, you may not want that exposition, that information, but that doesn't mean you're scared. You're just, like, uncomfortable and weirded out by this ghost laying stuff on you in the middle of the hallway at 2 a.m. But, um, yeah, ghosts, I don't, even, I don't see how ghosts ever stand on the second floor. They should just fall through to the first floor, and they should just <laughs> keep falling. I don't know why, like, do we believe that they can stand on solid matter because they're not solid? It doesn't make sense to well, me. Well, I think the research shows they're lighter than air, right? Yeah, then why don't they float up to the stratosphere? Well, that's they, they, true also. They, they confuse me a lot. I don't understand ghosts at all. If, if, ghosts, if ghosts are on a trajectory to become corporeal, then they can be scary to me. But if ghosts are always spectral, then I don't care about them. Well, I will say, I never understand yeah. ghosts and their clothes. Yeah. Like, no. why some outfits and not others? Why are they tattered? Were they buried in tattered clothes? Yeah. Is the clothes yet? Yeah, no, that's yeah. always a little difficult. But yeah. I'm going to go with ghosts. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a healthy fear of zombies, like yeah. anyone should. I am a zombie guy. But ghosts, I don't like because they're unexpected. Zombies, there are hordes of them. There are waves of them. Yeah. You can wall up in a house and commit suicide. You know, you always save the last bullet with zombies uh, for yourself. But with ghosts, you're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, there's a ghost. You know, you are like uh, going downstairs to get a glass of water, there's a ghost. You're minding your everything, there's a ghost. Like they can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I gotta say for sure, ghosts are an eternal jump scare. Yeah, they Do you know are. what I mean? Just they jump are. scare, jump scare, yeah. jump scare, jump scare. They are, but they don't eat your throat, you know? No, it's true, it's true. But I just think in general, if I had yeah. a ghost in my house, yeah. my life would be scarier. So yeah. I'd always be like, Jesus Christ, you know? Yeah, yeah. All the yeah. time. Yeah, All right, so wait, ghosts? That's healthy. Yeah, that's healthy. Zombies. Oh, way more for zombies. And you guys are probably right, actually. <laughs> I wonder, wonder if a, can a zombie have a ghost? I don't think they can. Well, th that's true. Yeah. That's true. Although ghosts make you unpopular because then you start telling people you saw a ghost, they never believe you and they write you off. So they get you socially ostracized, yeah. which to me is a fate. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I try to pretend that's a fate worse than death for me, but it's the reality I live every day. Um, all right, next question. Oh, the deep thoughts. Okay, these are not verses. These are deep thoughts. All right. We're going to pontificate. First deep thought. What was the first slasher film? Man. Steven. How far back do we go, right? We'll go back to the beginning. Where are you going to go? 
it's easy to start. I know you and I both know movies from the 30s that probably qualify somewhat. Um, man, I'm probably going to say Black Christmas. Black so Christmas, 1974? 74? 74. 74. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Halloween, 78. Black Christmas, 74. Yeah. There's that short film, Foster's Release, in 71, but it's 14 minutes long. Yeah, you I don't told think me it that. counts. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's also a Flesh and Blood show from 72, which has all the elements of a slasher, but it didn't codify the genre the same way Halloween did. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but so where are you on um, uh, Peeping Tom and Psycho? I think they're slasher grandparents. I don't think they're actually slashers. I think Peeping Tom is a serial killer. He has cool down yeah. periods between what he does. And well, Norman Bates is a serial killer. He's though. a serial killer, too. Yeah, but yeah. he does have the the mask, the signature weapon, and there's so many in the slasher cam. He's got so many elements of the slasher, it just hasn't been put together right yet. Yeah. What about you, what do you think? Well, what about Bay of Blood, Mario Bava's Bay of Blood? Bay of Blood is, oh, it doesn't make sense if you actually look at the plot, of course. It's not a single killer, it's a series of killers, right. of course. But a lot of the kills, did get cloned by Friday the 13th 1 and 2, of course. It's kind of like a blueprint for, for yeah. early slasher stuff. And it's got teens going to a lake, partying, and getting killed. You know? yeah. So that's pretty familiar. But um, I, don't, I consider it a slasher grandparent as well. I don't consider it, consider it a slasher. OK, no, I'm with you so far. Yeah. So let's go back to the 30s. Yeah. Because yeah. I would say 13 women. I would which, say the 13th guest. 13th guest. Yeah. Oh. Which those, those, I, think, I think those came out within months of each other. Because they're both pre-code, right? Yeah. So yeah. wait, 13th guest I've never seen. 13th guest is there's an old house, and there was a dinner party or something that went bad there. And so there's 13 chairs around a dusty table, and these people all get invitations, and they come to the house, and someone in a robe who looks a lot like Ghostface is creeping around behind, pulling bad stuff, and keeps on luring these prospective guests into this one room where they pick up the phone to make a telephone call. And this is a spoiler, I'm sorry. When they pick up, the phone is electrified, so when they touch it, they die. And the ghost face killer is watching through some peepholes in the side of the wall. So, so it's unusual weapon, yeah, mast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And doing it for reasons of revenge. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 13, 13, 13 women mm -hmm. is, um, I'm going to spoil it because it's from 1932. So mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it by now, chances are slim. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but basically, it's sorority sisters. So we've already got a sorority. Mm -hmm. um, graduated from college, getting murdered one by one in unusual and bizarre ways that seem to involve hypnotism. And they all get a letter from um, a swami who's like predicting their future. And the letters are great. They're so up. It's like, dear Ms. Marjorie. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is my sad duty to say you will be crushed by bricks on the 11th of June. It will be a terrible death, and your child will witness it. Have my deepest yeah. regrets. Yeah. And um, so it's nice. It's very yeah. polite. Yeah. Um, and then these things happen, and it turns out that the Swami is being manipulated by Myrna Loy, who is... Um, out to kill all her old sorority sisters one by one because she is biracial in the movie, not in real life. And at university, they revealed this, which basically, because it's a pre-code movie, they can say like things like this, but basically made her fair game for all the guys. So apparently she was just like sexually assaulted repeatedly. And now she's murdering all her sorority sisters. And at one point gives one of their like children a small toy that's got, got a bomb in it, which I thought was pretty good. And the kills are brutal. They're really brutal. Yeah, they so are. I mean, I feel like both these are in the slasher ballpark. I think so. So, so what's first is the question. I don't know. But I would say both of them, yeah, because they're yeah. both pre-code. Yeah. 13 yeah. guests, 13 women. They both got 13 in the title. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're going to plant, I'm going to plant the flag there. Yeah, I will too. I think that's a good yeah. place. Like, I can't think of, I mean, the closest we can come before that would be 1925, Phantom of the Opera, because it's got the mask, the skulking around, but it's not really the same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. I'm, I wouldn't know. Yeah. I also want to say, I firmly think Peeping Tom and Psycho are serial killer so movies, which are a different animal. They're so good, I. and they influence the slasher, but yeah. different animal. Yeah, and well, giallos, a lot of people argue giallos are the original slashers, or slashers got what they got from the giallo, or from gialli, I guess you're supposed to say, but giallos are driven generally by greed or by the you know the, the serial killer in the mix somewhere. They're not driven by revenge or whatever it is that drives slashers. Yeah. They're not the same. And also, I would throw in that, to me, an essential component of a giallo is black leather gloves. Yeah, that's the and, mask. That's the mask. Yeah, well, that's the mask. It's true, but also, no, Michael doesn't wear gloves. Jason doesn't wear gloves, I don't think. Yeah. 
Yeah. Freddie has a glove, but yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Kid Michael wears gloves. But, um, oh, it's yeah. part of his costume. Yeah, 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 yeah. It they're white gloves, too. I always thought that John Carpenter was um, trying to do a, like a negative image of the Giallo, which was always black oh, gloves. Yeah. You know? Well, I can see that. Yeah, and he, yeah. he wrote Eyes of Lower Mars the same year, Halloween. Oh, know? which is a Giallo, Giallo basically, yeah. 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 Except with um, Fade on a Yeah. Yeah. All right, next question. Does a work of horror have to be scary? Man, I hate this question. I know. I, I get this question. I mean, like, I, my, the thing I hate is when people are like, someone's like, oh, that movie's really good, that book's really good, and someone says, it's not scary, it sucks. Yeah. yeah. Like, does it, must it, you know, like, <laughs> does it have well, to? Well, we, we might be on different sides, because I think it does have to be scary. You do? Really? Do, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if it, doesn't, if it doesn't disturb you in some way, then it's just... Um, replicating some of the conventions and tropes of horror, but it's not um, engaging your fear. Okay, we may be using, so what is scary to you? Because disturbing to me isn't scary. Oh, I've read disturbing books that didn't scare me, oh, disturb me. Disturbing is, to me is very scary. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I guess to me, it's like, to me scary is I'm actually like scared for my life, or like, oh, you know, that moment okay. before a really good jump scare or something. Disturbing to me is, you mean there can really be ghosts? That disturbs my worldview. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so yeah, so we've got semantic differences yeah. that make it yeah. almost impossible. To <laughs> but, so you, but you feel like it has to be scary. I think it does. I, I can't think of a horror novel that I've liked that didn't disturb or scare me at some point, or a movie either. But I also find a lot of them comforting. Like, no one would say yeah. that um, the Roger Corman Fall of the House, or um, Mask of the Red Death isn't a horror movie. It's a horror movie. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine anyone ever found it scary. You don't think even back then? Even the six, I, I don't know. Think, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I don't, I, I, man, I don't know. It, it's kind of scary to me. Okay, no, yeah. no, 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 that's yeah. fair. Yeah. So scary, not scary. Okay, <laughs> no, no, that's fair. Okay, where are people on this? Does it have to be scary? Let's see a show of hands. Three, four, five, six, seven. That's significant. It's a significant. It's all clustered around those middle tables. Uh, okay, what about not scary? Can it be horror and not be scary? Uh, one, two, three. Oh. One in the back, too. Yeah, no, much more diffuse, much fewer. Seven, eight. Well, I think what? there's eight. There's two over here, man. Oh, yeah. oh I don't know if they So count. I think not scary wins by just a nose. By a nose, yeah. a nose. Still controversial. All right, yeah. next yeah. question. Where was Jason before Friday Dude, the 13th? this is you. Like, oh, like where was he? Because he ostensibly drowns. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. it's how many years later? I mean, he drowns in 57. Pamela Voorhees does her bad stuff in 58. And then it's all the way up in 77 when the first one is set, I believe. So he's been somewhere for 20-something years. He has been. When? And, well, I mean, a, a similar question is where was he between one and two? What, like, growth chamber did he find <laughs> between one and oh, two? Yeah. And know, his the, skull shrunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um... I, where was Jason? I mean, underwater is the only like being a frog boy or something. That's the only thing we can we can answer. Because, but but the big question is why didn't he grow up if he was living underwater and eating tadpoles or whatever he's doing? You know, um, I wonder if that's not Jason. You know, it could be some other mutant kid who fell in. Well, see, here's the other problem I have with it is mm -hmm. because I really believe that Jason in one through four mm -hmm. is a human being. Yeah, so do I. And then and he five. becomes and, and five. five and five. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and then, then he becomes a zombie in six. He does. Like, yes. and so I don't like the idea that he's either Aquaman or a zombie in one. Like, yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. That just that would be like someone saying to me, um, I don't know. Like, like um, your mom isn't your mom. You know, yeah. like you've lived yeah. with her for you know eighty six years. Yeah. Not live yeah. with her. I don't live with my mother. <laughs> um, but like you know, you've known this woman for eighty six years. But it turns out she's. It's just like it turns too much. I've always accepted on its head. Yeah. Um, I wonder if Pamela, like, you know, we, we hear her throughout the initial Friday the 13th, like, kill them, mommy, kill them, mommy, that little kid voice. I wonder if her need for justice somehow conjured up his little corpse body from the bottom of the lake and reanimated him, you know? That's possible. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the world of horror, that's possible. Yeah. yeah. But I also yeah. wonder, you're right, what happens between one and two? Yeah, man. So yeah. I feel like I mean, you might have had it. Maybe it's not Jason. Yeah, in one. That, that'd be Maybe neat. that's not Jason. I mean, I mean, how can you recognize somebody who's been underwater for 20 years? And has a misshapen skull. I mean, uh, well, you would think, misshapen uh, skull. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But you know, when you see the flashback in Freddy vs. Jason of Jason drowning and Pamela is watching him, what you never can figure out is, why does this mother just watch her son drown? Why doesn't she go save him? Uh, <laughs> you know? I know. <laughs> I always yeah. felt like maybe she's not a good swimmer. She's not a strong uh, okay. swimmer. She's a cook only. She's a cook. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Also, when I was a child, 
Um, I, was, uh, I once fell through the ice in a, in a frozen pond, because I'm from South Carolina, where we don't, water doesn't freeze over, so we didn't know what was going on. So I walked out on it and fell through, and my sister was there with a, a broken arm. She'd gotten a compound fracture doing gymnastics. And um, her best friend, our next door neighbor, was there too. And my sister couldn't come in, because this is back when you had plaster casts, mm -hmm. but the neighbor couldn't come in because she'd just done her hair. And, um, <laughs> and I was five, and I was drowning in a frozen lake. Oh, and she was worried about her hair. She'll be like, I'll be in so much trouble with my mom. We just oh, wow. went to the salon yesterday. Wow. Um, so my sister had to come in, and then had to go get her arm oh. redone. So you almost turned into Jason. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And wow. my sister would have been Pamela Voorhees. She might have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so I can get not going in, yeah. you know? Okay, okay. Like, yeah. But okay, yeah. so we don't know where Jason was, but there is not a satisfactory answer, except there is maybe not, that's not Jason. You know, talking about him being a frog boy, when he erupts out of the water behind Alice in the first one, but she's in the canoe, he goes up behind yeah. her, he goes up like a shark, that, you doing like that, so. Strong swimming thighs. So either, yeah, either it's, yeah, he's a strong swimmer or it's really shallow there, you know? And I assume it's deep there, actually. She's in a canoe. Canoe. He's in a canoe on yeah. the lake, so he must be a swimmer of some sort. Because um, how do you propel up out of the water like that? So we've solved this. Frog yeah. boy Jason. Yeah. Frog yeah. boy Jason. Okay, yeah. next question. Yeah. We didn't even take a vote because we're so sure. No, yeah. yeah. Oh, favorite franchise. Favorite franchise, Final Girl. Yeah. Wait, favorite, favorite oh, Final Girl. Oh, franchise Final Girl in Friday the 13th, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Oh, a franchise Final Girl shows up in more than one. Adoration, more than one version. I don't think necessarily. Okay. I, we were just trying to differentiate between a final girl and something like a non-franchise movie, like oh, Slumber Party okay. Massacre One or okay. something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, in all three of the big, the big. Yeah. Um, I'll go first with. I think my favorite from Friday Thirteenth is Tina from Seven, the one with the mental powers, the Carrie. Oh yeah. She, um, she's the first person I've seen in the whole series who comes at Jason with equal power almost. Because you can't out-muscle Jason, you can't out-tough Jason, but you can take your telekinetic powers and slam him against the ground. I really, really, I cheered when that happened. I was so thrilled. So I'll go Friday the 13th, Adrian King. Mm -hmm. I, I, I gotta give it up for Adrian. Mm -hmm. She's in there, she doesn't have any role model. She doesn't, Ginny from Two is pretty great. She's yeah. actually a psychology major, an undergrad yeah. psychology major, and the, actually her undergrad degree comes in handy it and does. saves her life, which I don't think has ever happened for an undergrad psychology major yeah. in the history of the world. So I appreciate that with Ginny, but I'm yeah. gonna give it for Adrian because like she's in virgin territory yeah. there. You know that same, that movie Humongous does that same thing where they psychologize the killer and like weaponize that kind of stuff. It's really neat, you know? The problem with Humongous is yeah. it's so dark, I can't tell what's going <laughs> on. So maybe you're right, I don't know. Um, okay, so Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I wanna say, I'll, well, I'm gonna say Nancy from the first one because ah. what I appreciate about Nancy is that she thinks her way against Freddy. She uses her mind against Freddy. Um, she doesn't, like, like Tina on Friday the 13th, she doesn't have telekinetic powers. And she, it's not about hitting him with a machete or a pitchfork or anything like that. She puts gunpowder in light bulbs. She rigs sledgehammers above doorways. And then she finally turns her back on Freddy, which um, that's the best way to take power away from bullies is not consider them, I think. And I, I really think she's a good model for all of us. And she, um, she didn't get cloned enough, I think. I think we need more Nancys out there, really. Yeah, because yeah. she doesn't come back till three and then seven. seven. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm going to go for Alice Johnson, Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5, which I think are yeah. underrated Nightmares on Elm Street. They 4 are. is great if you it haven't really, seen it with the time loop and all that really stuff. It really is so good. Um, and uh, Alice Johnson starts as a little milk toast, mm -hmm. and she winds up a total badass with the... After Sigourney Weaver and Aliens, mm -hmm. the best gearing up scene, second best gearing yeah. up scene in 80s movies. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a gearing up scene that only 80s can do it, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And her brother fights Freddy in a dream dojo mm -hmm. with karate, I think mm -hmm. actually with taekwondo, and almost yeah. wins. Yeah. So yeah. if Freddy has to cheat. Yeah. Um, and then she gives birth yeah. to Freddy in the next one. And that yeah. was the thing with nightmare movies is, um, there's something very bad touch about them, like A, the glove, B, he's a pedophile, but C, like, unlike everyone else, Freddy's always coming out of people's bodies, yeah, or yeah. they're giving birth to him, or yeah. his legs coming up between their legs, or he's licking their faces. Freddy's, like, very touchy. 
Mm -hmm. um, he's like he's like Uncle Sticky. Like I yeah, just, he it's is. just yeah. he's just like touchier than the other guys are. It's really I find it off putting. But yeah, I'm with Alice Johnson. Yeah, I love Alice too. She's she's bad. Okay, Halloween. Oh, my favorite Halloween final girl. I think Laurie Strode, of course. I mean, I like little Jamie Lloyd. She's tough, but I, well, Laurie Strode is where it's at for me. She, her, her vigilance is what keeps her, what makes her survive the initial night in Haddonfield in 1978. Because you know, look at her. She can be in her English classroom while the teacher is droning on, and she's actually looking out the window, and she sees Michael. So she's got her attention split. And the teacher calls on her to answer a question, and she answers that question perfectly. She's able to be present in the moment, but also aware of her surroundings. Multitasking. And, yeah, yeah. And um, and when Michael drives by in that stolen station wagon, her friends are her friends don't sense any menace. She senses all the menace. That's 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 Lori's special power. I mean, she's a good babysitter. She defends her charges, but um, and she keeps them safe. And she you know pokes Michael with a coat hanger and with a knitting needle, but. Her vigilance is what I appreciate the most, and that has been copied a whole lot. Yeah. I'm going to go for Jamie Lloyd, Danielle yeah. Harris, uh, in mm -hmm. Halloween 4. I think 4 is an underrated Halloween. <laughs> it's got that great opening with that Midwestern, yeah. like, pumpkins and windmills and yeah. all that, and corn and scarecrows. And she's a little kid. She's a little kid final girl, which I think is good. And she ends the movie, spoiler alert, but it's from the 80s. Should have seen it by now. Um, but, you know, crazy and trying to kill her mom, like, yeah, which yeah. I kind of feel like is sort of like where a lot of final girls would wind up in real life. Like, yeah. you just lose. I mean, it's too much. Yeah, it's no, like, I agree. It's what happens to Tommy Jarvis, or what we think happens to Tommy Jarvis at the end of four. Yeah. 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 But I will say that Jamie Lloyd, uh, or Jamie Lloyd in Halloween 5 mm -hmm. works my nerves. Mm -hmm. Like, she's mute. She's yeah. annoying. That's the one where she's having the dreams. She's yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. irritating in yeah. five. Or yeah. five, I said four, in five. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. irritating in five, but great in four. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. Which uh, decade was the most important to horror? Take off, man. All right, well, actually, let's do a, let's do a poll on people real quick before we dive in. I want to know, show of hands, I'm going to run through all the decades. Which one's the most important for horror? So 30s? Forget the 20s. We, none of us have seen enough movies from the 20s. 30, okay. Uh, the well, un Universal the Monsters, Universal. all that, yeah. yeah. 40s? Yeah. The Wolfman, the Cat People. Yeah. Uh, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. No, that's 50s. The 50s, I mean, that's yeah. 50. 50s. Giant Monsters, Godzilla. Godzilla. Any of that? Okay, 60s, we've got Psycho. We've got Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby. All right. Yeah. All right, 70s. Yeah. All right. Oh, so good result. Okay, 80s. Four five. Yeah. Pretty good joint. 90s. Oh, <laughs> 2000s. I heard a ha for that in 2000. All right, so the 70s and 80s seem to be taking it. They do. Yeah. All right, uh, yeah. I'm going to go for the 90s, and here's why. So the traditional wisdom is that horror sucked in the 90s, right? You had the whole horror paperback boom that started with Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and Thomas Tryon's The Other at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. That was gone. And not only was it gone at the beginning of the 90s, like, it wiped out all the publishing lines with it. Like, there was no more horror in print. Most of the magazines that were doing fiction went out of print. The movies really slowed down. There were too many of them. They were going straight to video. A lot of really bad ones were getting made. But that was the decade when horror went to TV. And we've got the big three that I think shaped so much that came after. Twin Peaks, The X-Files, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I feel like kids who grew up on those grew up with a different kind of horror. To them, horror wasn't gory. Horror, horror could be gory, but it didn't have to be gory. Horror could be scary, but it didn't have to be scary. Horror could be romantic. Horror could be empowering. Horror could be funny. Horror could be surreal. And I feel like those kids got such a different view of horror that was so much more inclusive than the horror I grew up on, which was it's gory and it's scary. They got such a wide view of it that I feel like, you know, between Twin Peaks and Buffy and the X-Files, they really knew that horror could do more. And then in 96, you got Scream, which really is... I think you and I would agree, maybe one of the most perfect slashers ever made. For sure. Uh, and that spawned a whole wave of other stuff. But then in 99, and I'm going to hear groans, I'm prepared, it's okay, thick skin, Blair Witch Blair Witch, Project, yeah. which, which really launched between that. Yes, exactly. I saw that opening weekend and was terrified, terrified. And in fact, I was talking to someone, and they said that they saw this 
on opening weekend at a theater in, I think, South Dakota. And they were only them. There were five friends in the theater watching it. It was the last, and there was like two other people there. It was the last show of the night. So no other theaters. There. And when they got up to leave, one of the theater employees had gone and stood facing the corner in the lobby. And he's like, we all froze. And like no one would cross the lobby because we were so freaked out. And then it launched the whole found footage craze, which there are bad ones, there's good ones. But so you've got Scream, found footage, Buffy, X-Files, Twin Peaks, 90s wins, <laughs> Steven. You know, my impulse is to go with the 80s because that's when Jason was born, that's when Freddy was born, that's when Chucky was born. But to tell you the truth, I'm going to land on the 70s finally because the 70s gave us that wave of prestige horror. You know, everybody trying to be Rosemary's baby. Um, mm. Like The Omen is probably the best example of that. But it also, and this I think is the most important thing, it gave us Jaws, and that gave us the summer yeah. blockbuster. And without the summer blockbuster, I'm not sure studios would have greenlit other horror projects. They wanted to cash in. They want that Jaws money, of course. So I think the prestige horror like roped horror into some sort of like conditional respectability, but Jaws made it a moneymaker, or made it be a possible moneymaker. And I think those two things were super helpful to horror. All right, so show if you've heard the arguments. Show of hands for the 70s. <laughs> take a side. Even if you weren't for the 70s before, take a side. Let's see a show of hands for the 70s. Eight. Eight, eight? eight OK. Eight or show nine. of hands for the 90s. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Ah, <laughs> damn you. All right, so it's the 70s which I tend to agree with. But, <laughs> all right, moving on. Next question. What's the oldest horror movie you watched for pleasure? You know, for me, you know, I want to say Night of the Hunter, but I haven't, I haven't watched Night of the Hunter for probably three years, so that'd be a lie. I can't lie to y'all. I'm going to say Psycho. I still watch Psycho pretty much twice a year, probably. Oh, it's great. Yeah, and it still, it works for me every time. I even, recently, I went and watched the Gus Van Zandt one, the remake, the Shot for Shot remake with Vince Vaughn. It's pretty good, too. You know? Is it? Yeah, it's, it's all right, man. man. Well, I also, I love the scene with Marion Crane mm -hmm. and uh, Norman Bates having dinner. Yeah. Just trying to relate to weird yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, no, and... It, yeah, it's just, it's just everything in it works, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And actually, my, my secret headcanon is that uh, uh, Janet Lee plays Jamie Lee Curtis's secretary in Halloween H2O yeah. in the yeah. 90s, which I think is an underrated Halloween installment. Yeah. And I always like to imagine that she is Marion Crane's sister. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever her name is, whatever yeah. Crane. Yeah, uh, Because she says at one point, you know, mm -hmm bad things have happened to everyone in the past. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, your sister got murdered and, and you almost got murdered. If I remember correctly, the car she pulls away in has the same license plate Does as Marion Crane's car. I think so. Oh, uh, so it clearly is her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's 1931s. And, and so Dracula came out in 31. It was like the first American mm -hmm. real horror movie. I mean, supernatural horror, all that. But the very end, I think on December like 25th, Christmas Day, 1931, so it's technically 1932, but actually, no, it's considered 32, but really 1931, Robert Mamoulian's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Frederick March won an Oscar for playing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and they call him Jekyll the whole time, which I guess that's one way of saying it. Um, <laughs> but it's a pre-code movie, which meant it could be sexy, it could be more violent, and it is astonishing. If you have not seen this movie, this is the filthiest, dirtiest movie I've ever seen. You have not lived until you've watched Frederick March dressed up like a Neanderthal man, fondling the knob of his crane and literally drooling all over a dance hall girl. It is so gross, but it's so good. Yeah. Um, the technical chops are impeccable. They do all the face changes into from... Uh, uh, Jekyll the Hyde. They do them like in one shot, like American Werewolf in London. And they do it all with these, like, because it's black and white, you can't tell with all these colored lenses and gels. So, like, they could make the makeup different colors and then make it seem to be coming out as they strip the gels from the lights. He does this monkey act at the end when he's running from the cops that the guy's like Jackie Chan. Uh, if you have not seen the 19th, and, and he won an Oscar, you know, like, um, just like Tom Hanks. Uh, and so, like, it, it's amazing. And so, I. If you haven't seen it, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1931, it's dirty, it's gross, it's depraved, it's great. Two of its children, I would say one of its children is Altered States. Oh, you know? completely, yeah, completely. Yeah, the, the other is Face Off with Cage and Travolta. 100%, no, I would go with that. I mean, that is a Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, if yeah. like, 
Although it's, it's more like Jekyll and Jekyll. I mean, hide and hide, right? Like Nick Cage versus, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's got amazing makeup, though. They make, they make Nick Cage look just like John Travolta. By the way, when they show this shot of us on stage that I can see in this monitor, yeah. you guys are lucky to be looking at these chicken legs tonight. They look pretty good. Um, all right, next question. Wait, did we, did we miss something? Oh, favorite and greatest horror movie set piece? Uh, I will go with... The peep shot, the the peephole kill in opera, Dario Argento's opera. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it's it, they, the tension in that is crazy because we there's a killer on the loose and guns are not out of the scene. This isn't they can use guns in this movie, and this woman is in her apartment penthouse somewhere, and a knock comes at the door and she is one of the targets. So you know she's in jeopardy, and she knows not to answer the door, but she goes and looks for the peephole and there's somebody there saying I'm from the cops or whatever and will you open it? And she's like, no. And there's a lot of cat and mouse. Will you open? No, I won't open. You should open because of this, but I don't want to open because of that. And they do that for, it's, it's, it's painful. It lasts so long. And then she finally gets to where she might be trusting him. And this is a spoiler. I guess I should have said that in the first place. And she looks, <clears throat> and it's going to be totally safe. And um, they've been showing us her point of view, looking through the peephole. And this last time, they did, Argento does something a little bit different. And um she gets shot through the peephole, and it's like, it's in high resolution slow motion, and it is like ballet for the eyes. It is amazing. And I don't know how they pull that shot. No, off. I don't know how it's either. It's astonishing. It really is amazing. I love that. What's yours? So I considered a lot. There's the last shot, the last scene of George Romero's Monkey Shines, because the whole movie sets up that moment, like a two-hour movie to set up this one payoff. Mm -hmm. There's. Um, there is uh, the beginning of Suspiria, which for me, I love. I know you don't like Suspiria, but I love that cab ride. But I, I love that Suspiria gave us um, the opening of Scream, though, because Drew Barrymore hanging from that tree is also yes. that opening girl in Suspiria. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's, um, there's, I love the beginning of Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead in the news station uh, with mm -hmm. people walking off the job. As mm -hmm. the, the first scene in 28 Weeks Later, the sequel to 28 Days Later, is one of the most perfect mm -hmm. short horror movies I've ever seen in my life, mm -hmm. and truly horrific, but I finally settled for the opening of Scream, the yeah. Casey kill. Yeah. It is, you and I have talked about this yeah. endlessly. It is. It is one of the greatest scenes in horror movie history. Mm -hmm. um, and you read the script, and most of it's there in the script, those beats, you know, mm -hmm. do you like scary movies? He's calling the boyfriend reveal outside. But then, the fact that Drew Barrymore was cast as the lead and decided mm -hmm. she'd rather play this part, which totally makes it something different. Mm -hmm. You don't expect this like big star to get killed in the beginning of a movie. On top of that, they then do this amazing, amazing thing with um, uh, the, the choices Wes Craven makes throughout. Like when um, she's trying to call to her mother, but her throat's been crushed, mm -hmm. and her mom's just walking by her, she can't make it. When mm -hmm. she, and, the yeah, mask reveal. Yeah, when when she pull when she when Drew Barrymore is on her last you know gasp, she's on her back about to get stabbed. She reaches up and pulls off Ghostface's mask, and she has a look of recognition. She goes, "Oh, like she knows who it is," and she recognizes this person, which means it's somebody in her social circle, somebody she knows in the town. And what that does is that charges every single scene that comes after. We're thinking it's a sheriff, it's Dewey, it's a teacher, it's the principal, it's all her little Someone friend group. Someone we see, yeah. yeah. So that it's it's a brilliant, brilliant way to have everything that comes after charged differently. It's such a good decision. And then there's that there's the moment, and the last thing I'll say about it is the guy who scored it, Beltrami, was not a horror movie composer. Mm -hmm. And so the score is actually very moving and emotional rather than a horror movie score. And there's a shot where you think, where Drew Barrymore keeps getting away from the killer. And they do this thing in movies where they're like, we want to kill a major character early to prove to you that anyone could die. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, every movie that does that, I can tell you who's going to die still and probably in what order. It's not that hard to figure out. But in this, Drew Barrymore is getting away from the killer. And a couple of people do after that. And it sets up this thing where you're like, oh, I'm uncertain, not because anyone could get killed, but because anyone could get away. And there's a shot where she almost gets away, and it cuts down to slow motion, and the music gets really legit tragic. Mm -hmm. And he stabs her, and you really feel it. This is not a Friday the 13th movie. It's yeah. not Halloween. Yeah. It is a sad, we are sad she's dying. We are, and it's so funny. Whether it's Billy or Stu doing it at that moment, it's just an actor. And, but when you... They're so specific to stab her in the blood squib, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you have to aim that knife. 
<laughs> it cracks me up. All right, so yeah. opera, scream. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Oh, if I would have considered that first 12 minutes a set piece, I would have said No, scream, you've gone but... on about it at great length. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sort of stealing this from you. <laughs> All right, favorite and greatest horror movie. Wait, what's this? Uh, We're doing favorite... that one again, man. Oh, yeah, next one. Favorite film from the post screen boom? Oh, I will. Uh, there's a lot of good ones, I think. And I, well, I guess we need to figure out where the boom stops, too, right? I would probably stop it around Cherry Falls. Yeah. Right around there. I think that's right. Or Valentine. They're both they're pretty close. But I would probably come down on the first urban legend. I like the first urban legend a lot. That, okay. That yeah. First, no. That first kill is brilliant. The axe in the back seat and everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with the faculty simply because. Mm -hmm. It's a killer cast, mm -hmm. and I love the fact that the hero of the movie is the drug dealer, and the thing that can defeat the aliens is his homemade like yeah. uh, bath salts. Yeah. So, so great. Yeah. All right. Next question. Best meta slasher, not counting Scream. Ah. Go. No, you go. You I'll take go. it. I'm gonna say Cabin in the Woods. I think. I think Cabin in the Woods upped the game considerably. It. But it still had the terror, just like, like the same way that Scream was parodic, but it still engaged the core dynamic of the slasher, so did Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods showed us a superstructure around the slasher, but it didn't stop being a slasher itself. And that bloodbath in the third act is one of the most beautiful bloodbaths yeah. of any bloodbath. It's good. It's good. I'm going to go for and this is a movie I hated the first mm -hmm. time I saw it. And then I saw it at a drive-in during the pandemic and was like, whoa, this is an amazing movie. Nightmare on Elm Street 7. Uh, new Nightmare. Mm. Or no, sorry, yeah, yeah. Seven, New Nightmare. Yeah. Um, it is so well done. The, the special effects are great. Mm -hmm. The whole meta angle is great. The least convincing thing, because, I mean, clearly I'm in the tank for Wes Craven. The least convincing thing in Nightmare on Elm Street 7 is Wes Craven playing Wes Craven. Yeah. He is yeah. not a good actor at even playing himself. <laughs> He's terrible. He's the worst thing in the movie. If he just cast anyone else, the, yeah. the craft services guy, it would be yeah. an infinitely better movie. Yeah, that's not his house either. Everybody thinks that's his real house. Oh, it's not really it's his not house? His real... Yeah. yeah so yeah, so no, that's the one for me. Um, <laughs> that is a, that's so good with building the claw. The... Building the claw and it and yeah. like Freddy looks a little more organic. He does. And yeah. the mm -hmm. the thing that doesn't hold up also the that, that that bad CGI truck stuff in the middle where the kids sleepwalking yeah. across. That's yeah. still but you know what? Special effects they're yeah. always advancing. No, but I, I'm I'm glad they did that corny CGI instead of putting a real kid out there in that traffic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I, they probably tried a real kid and they lost a few. And they're like, okay, yeah. let's CGI this thing. We're going to be here all day. Um, all right, next question. What non horror genre pairs best with horror? Oh, like science fiction horror or Western horror? Noir, noir, yeah, noir, noir horror. horror. Hey, or erotica. I think Barker does a lot of like erotica adjacent stuff. That's true. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, stuff. I always thought Barker's like was, was a sort of an erotica writer to yeah. some extent. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, this is, it's, um, I think the Western myself, I think it pairs up really well with the, with horror because a key part, a key like little movement in most horror stories is isolation. And I think the Western is built to provide isolation, you know, somebody crossing a desert or alone in a town or whatever it is. So I think Westerns, I think we haven't seen enough good horror Westerns actually. There's that, almost none. Yeah, I mean, would you consider near dark a horror Western? I would, kind yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, they do wear some cowboy hats in it, and it is kind of in the West, but I don't, I don't know. I, w I would consider it rural, rural vampire stuff. Rural vampires. Yeah. Rural. Um, what is that one um, where those bank robbers in, like, 1884 hit a bank, retreat to a house, and there's all these little crawly creatures, like, from The Descent? That's a really good movie, and I can't remember what it's called. But, the but it's a Western? It's a Western, yeah. yeah I can't really think of any yeah. real horror bone, Western. I mean, Bone Tomahawk has horror sequences in it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know if I'd call it horror, really. Yeah. But, no, I think, so I guess I'm proving myself wrong. I, I think the Oh, Western, The Borrowers, JT. Yeah, uh, that's right. JT Petty's. Yeah. Which, actually, I think is good. Yeah. Um, so I think the Western would pair wonderfully with horror. It just hasn't been done very often. Yeah. Cutthroat's Nine. Have you seen Cutthroat's Nine? Oh, Cutthroat's Nine. Yeah, I yeah. call that. I mean, it's, it's, isn't that Fulci? No, it's... No. Uh, Who is that? Sergio Martino? It might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's um, brutal, man. Yeah, I know it is. And Fulci yeah. made a couple of Westerns. That we're not really? super brutal. Yeah, Did not super brutal. But huh. So part of me wants to say noir just because I feel like Angel Heart is, a, is an overlooked movie with yeah. Mickey Rourke, but also the book it's based on, Falling Angel is amazing, and it's a straight-up noir, 
and it's really good. If you haven't read it, it's still in print. It's really great. And mm. I think the author says William Horch, Horchberg, mm. um, who is like a California hippie dude, the one horror novel he wrote. It's amazing. But I think I'm going to have to say science fiction because I'm not sure a year goes by when I don't rewatch Alien and Aliens and the third one, which is my favorite of the bunch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I just... I just feel like that is right there. Event Horizon, I wouldn't say is a good movie, but it's an enjoyable movie. It's a scary to me. Yeah. Hellraiser goes to space. He Leprechaun does. goes to space. Jason. Jason goes, Jason to, goes space. to space. They all wind up in space. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm going to say sci-fi yeah. horror. Yeah, no, you're right. The first Alien is terrifying, but you yeah. know, I'm, I'm of that small camp that I really like Alien 4, Resurrection. Man. Really? Yeah, that really, is a small camp. It is. A very yeah. small, it's pretty much just me. But I'm <laughs> It's me and the one person who likes the Avatar live action movie. <laughs> you know, we like we like Resurrection, but I love when that alien baby is born and it's got all those mammalian characteristics. It's quit being so insectile, and I feel so sorry for that baby because it's the, the, the only white one. one, right? The albino. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's sad. It's, it's the only one of its kind. Yeah, you know? no, it's sad. I yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I also have to say, if anyone's looking for science fiction horror to read, Peter Watts is the place to go. Um, I think the first one, Starfish, the first, the other, he made these other underwater ones, but Starfish mm. is amazing. And Blind Sight, which is getting made into yeah. a movie at some point, yeah. which is a vampire, space vampires. Oh, and Life Force. How did we yeah. forget Life Force? Toby Hooper's other third greatest moment. It's a good point. I forgot yeah. Life Force, yeah. All right, next question. Most underrated slasher from any period? Underrated, all right. You go first. Oh, man. Jesus. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to say Slumber Party Massacre. And I'm going to say that because Slumber Party Massacre is a movie I grew up not wanting to see because it sounds like garbage, right? It sounds like sheer garbage. It's Slumber Party Massacre. You know it's going to be girls with their boobs out getting massacred. Uh, it sounds awful. But it is one. I, I, only, I saw it for the first time like a year ago, year, about a year ago. And it's amazing. It's one of these three movies that Roger Corman produced that all had female writers and directors. Mm -hmm. And um, Rita May, Amy Clark Davidson, I think, is the director. Mm -hmm. And Rita Mae Brown, the feminist author, is a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. And I actually talked to someone who um, is writing a book about Slumber Party Massacre. And she had interviewed Roger Corman. And I was like, oh my god, you got to have stories. What stories? And she said that at one point, um, Roger Corman was like, well, I want this to subvert slashers. I don't want it to be about men looking at women. I want it to be about how men look at women. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And then he proceeded to explain for half an hour the male gaze to Rita Mae Brown, one of the most famous feminist authors of the like 70s and 80s. Uh, and like, I wish I could have been there. That must yeah. have been amazing to see her just yeah. chewing through her cheek as she tried yeah. to keep her <laughs> keep quiet. Um, but it's a, it's a really well-made movie. It's a really funny movie. Um, they do a lot of things with slasher and they're fine. There's some great set pieces in it. And the women in it, yes, they're in their underwear a lot. Yes, they're all in a volleyball team. But they're all people. They, they are simultaneously brave and cowardly and stupid and smart. And there's a great moment in it where you always see that moment in a horror movie where someone's trying to get inside the safe place and people are like, we can't let them in. The killer will come in. Whether it's a slasher or a zombie movie or a monster movie, you know, they're banging on the door and you have this tragic moment where you have to listen to your friend die. And at Slumber Party Massacre, one of the girls runs. She's like, let me in, let me in. He's right by me. He's right behind her, like Russ Thorne with his giant phallic power drill. Uh, he's going to drill her. And, um, and they don't think twice. They let her in. She's their friend. He gets in the house and kills more of them, but they're like, it's not even a consideration. She's our friend. We can't leave her alone. It's so good. So yeah, Slumber Party Massacre. It is. No, I, I like Slumber Party Massacre a lot too. And I consider Slumber Party Massacre 2, number 2 in 87, yeah. to be the actual end of the Golden Age. I think it is... The slasher has decayed so far that we got Summer Party Massacre 2, you know? <laughs> with, with Do the Buzz. Yeah. No, yeah, oh, Lit's yeah. Buzz. Lit's Buzz. The <laughs> yeah, musical number yeah. in the middle of it. The guy has a killer guitar that's actually a weapon. Yeah, it's yeah. got the drill at the end. Yeah, which like always that. bugs me, because how do you tune that guitar? I the end know. is a drill. Well, how, do have, how do you have enough battery power to run that drill? I don't yeah. understand that It either. does come unplugged at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's um, yours? Oh, the most underrated slasher from any period. I'm going to say Graduation Day from like 81, maybe 82. I like Graduation Day a lot. I don't lot. think I've ever seen Graduation Day. Yeah, Graduation Day, Day is it's solid. It gets, it gets like pushed to the side a lot because it starts out with one actress in a role, who, and she gets replaced by Linnea Quigley, and we're supposed to accept that's the same person, you know, which is a big jump. <laughs> and it was because this initial actress, whoever it was, 
wouldn't take her top off, which is, I think that's great for people to make a stand like that, but then instead of saying, okay, don't do that, like the director in Friday the 13th Part 6 did with that movie, this director said, you're fired, and he brought in Linnea Quigley to be that character. And, but the wonderful thing about Graduation Day is that just like Scream, it's really difficult to guess who the killer is. Even if you know it, I always like forget it when I'm rewatching that movie, and it really moves through itself quite well, and it owes something to Psycho. I think it has a lot of lineage with Psycho. So yeah, I think Graduation Day is not taken seriously enough. I need to see it, yeah. All right, we're on the lightning round where it's gonna be one sentence or one title answers from us. So, is Alien a slasher? Steven, yes or no? No. No, next question. Is Ellen Ripley a final girl? No. Yes. No. No, okay. Next question, is Jaws a slasher? No. 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 Bella Lugosi versus Christopher Lee? Lugosi. Lugosi. <gasps> <laughs> Who's the better Hannibal Lecter? I think, um, 91, Anthony Hopkins. Oh, for me it's Brian Cox and Manhunter, yep. yep. Yeah. Okay, next. The most important three horror movies. Most important, not your favorites. Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Scream. I would say Psycho, Jaws, Psycho, oh, Psycho Jaws the Exorcist. Psycho mm. Jaws the Exorcist, yeah. That's good. Okay. Your favorite three horror movies. Favorite three, Scream, Cabin in the Woods, and Paranormal Activity. I'm going to say, and, and uh, Dawn of the Dead, the original, Return of the Living Dead, I'm a zombie guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the third one, I, I'm going to have to go with Jaws, actually. It's the mm -hmm. one I've seen the most. You know, I would, well, this is lightning around. I would go for Jaws all the time, but I think one person should live at the end instead of two. Man. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's yeah, fair. Yeah. Okay, next. Horror franchise that should be so much better. There's a lot to choose from. Man, there are, aren't there? Um, it should be so much better. I'm going to have to go with Halloween, because I think when Halloween took that turn into the cult stuff, the Thorn Society or whatever it's called, that was a low point, and I think Halloween, if it would just stuck to the basics of Halloween, it would have been better. I'm gonna say Texas Chainsaw. I think one mm -hmm. is legendary, mm -hmm. two I enjoy. Mm -hmm. After that, man, color me gone. Yeah. Although you could also say the Puppet Master movie. I was, there's like 17 of those. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Children of the Corn, there's like probably 22 of those. Oh, uh, jeez, I know, Children of the Corn should be way, except yeah. Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, top notch. <laughs> All right, next question. Hammer versus AIP. I think AIP because it's more schlocky. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with AIP because they had Vincent Price. Screw yeah. you, Hammer. I'll yeah. take my one Vincent Price over Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Yeah. yeah. Also, so I heard. I heard some gossip from someone who had done a lot of like video extra features who said that Christopher is the most boring man on the planet. Huh. And like as soon as he starts telling stories, everyone on the crew just like tries to go away because they're wow. so boring. Yeah. Oh, wow. But he does, he is a musician. He plays yeah. metal. Wow. Going for this is turning into a less of a lightning round. Okay, next yeah. question. Remake that's better than the original. The Thing. Uh, the Fly. I, and actually Invasion of the Body Snatchers, I'd say. Well, original well, that's better than the remake. Um, oh man, go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think. Prom night. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say Carrie. <laughs> Most people are like that was a re they had a remake. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a sequel. It's terrible. Yeah, the rage. Next question: Horror movie or moment that genuinely upset you as a child? It would be in The Watcher in the Woods. Every time the oh, shit, every yeah. time the wind was blowing through the treetops and we felt that presence, that just really unsettled me. There's a Disney movie called Darby O'Gill and the Lost Little People. Oh. It's Sean Connery and a bunch of leprechauns. We saw it at Peter Mansfield's birthday party. I'm sorry we're in my childhood again. And the banshee comes on at the end. Oh, and man, every child in that room wet their pants. And I am not ashamed to say I was one of them. Wow, wow. Horror movie, oh, least favorite way to die. Alone. Oh, wow, yeah, eaten alive for me, yeah. That's why I can't watch Italian cannibal movies. Uh, if you were a killer and a slasher, what would your weapon? Uh, what would be your weapon of choice? Crossbow. I would choose a lance. 
Really? Yeah, because they're you can get a lot of you can shish kebab people with that, man. The only time I've seen a lance use John Coyne's paperback uh, Hobgoblin. It's mm. an RPG mm. sort of satanic panic paperback from mm. the '80s, but they play a role playing game at the end. They're in a castle and someone's lance and everyone. Oh, so I'm thinking of that Friday the Thirteenth Two Kill where Jason goes through the top of those oh, two people, which two, is a which is a rip off of Bay of the Blood. Bay, Bay of Blood, Blood yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah, crossbow for me. All right, Lance, for you. Horror movie you watched the most number of times. Scream. Return of the Living Dead. Monster that genuinely scares you? Sea monsters. Alligators. In the same ballpark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Candy corn, keep or kill? Keep. Kill. <laughs> Would you rather be murdered by Jason, Freddy, or Michael? Let's debate this for a second. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to feel like, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. I used to feel like I'd go for Michael because he just pokes you with a knife and you fall over dead. Um, but I forgot that he's always bashing people's heads into stuff over mm -hmm. and over again. I don't mm -hmm. want to be beaten to death. That's mm -hmm. my second least favorite way to die. Third's mm -hmm. drowning. Um, Freddy, I don't want to be turned into a human-sized roach and have my arms and legs mm -hmm. broke. Like, those are perverse deaths. Yeah. I think by default, I'm going to go with Jason, even though I don't want to be in a sleeping bag and get banged out against a tree. Yeah, or be on a foldable bed that he folds the wrong way. Or, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know, man. Which would you do? You know, uh, to go through them... I my initial thought was Michael, because I think his kills are the cleanest of all they three They are of these. clean, yeah. And like Jason will do something like if you're doing a spry handstand before sex, then he will split you yeah. from crotch to neck, you know, which is, which is bad. Um, but um, I think finally Freddy, I know it's not good to be like really? killed by a but the thing with Freddy is it's comforting to die by Freddy, because like say your whole life you've been scared of cockroaches. And then you see your arm erupt into a cockroach foreleg, and you start to turn into a cockroach, then your last thought is going to be, my fears were justified, you know? That's true. And it's got to feel good to know that you were right all along. To be like, I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although I'm going to say, I'm going to push back on that a little, because yeah. often if you die yeah. at the hands of Freddy, you wind up yeah. coming through his chest or being a, a, soul, a piece of Pizza. pepperoni on the soul pep or yeah. pizza. Yeah, you do. So, but yeah. I'll, my pro I, I was going to go back to Michael, but he also hangs people on hooks a lot. I don't want to be hung on a hook. No, he so, does. So, yeah, I'm going yeah. for Jason. You're going yeah. for Freddy. Next yeah. question. Not... Holiday that needs its own horror franchise, Easter. Oh, I would say um, tax day. The tax man cometh. <laughs> man. Yeah. I would go for Thanksgiving, too, but I feel like they've already had a couple of Thanksgiving horror movies. I'm, I'm Easter all yeah, the way. Yeah, there's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Home Sweet Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you think the world will end? Oh. Um, not with a bang, but a whimper. That's the best I got. Man. Ghost apocalypse, man. Ghost apocalypse. <laughs> There's more of them than there are of us. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this Japanese movie called Pulse by Kiyoshi yeah. Kurosawa. Yeah. Yes, which is one of the most horrifying horror movies ever made. That is Ghost Apocalypse. Yeah, Ghost Apocalypse. I can't figure out why there's no Neanderthal ghosts, though. That really confuses me. I don't understand why we don't have caveman ghosts. You know? They're probably just somewhere else. You think so? You know, like, yeah, they're not in grand old houses. They're in the woods. They're in the caverns. I guess so. Like, yeah. they're, they're doing their thing. Yeah, they could be. I don't know if I believe in those ghosts. <laughs> what, Neanderthal ghosts? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like if you believe in one ghost, you've got to believe in one. I, I mean, agree. there is a theory that yeah. people have that the Loch Ness Monster is a ghost dinosaur. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, it's a relatively popular theory among crazy people. You, you know what, what scares me? Like, this is, this is ghost adjacent, are all those, like, Bridey Murphy stories, all the reincarnation stories, those terrify really? me. Really? Reincarnations and, terrifies that you? That terrifies me. Well, the, the scary ones terrify me. When it's, like, comforting, like, I came back as a cat and had a great life for 15 years, that's not scary. But all these people having unwanted memories of 1870 when they're in 1982, that just shakes me to the core. Yeah. Were you worried as a kid you might be reincarnated? I was terrified. <laughs> I still am pretty scared. Yeah. Literally never crossed my mind. Um, is that the end of lightning round? I think it is. Okay. We All will right. now. Oh, no. Oh, what slasher is most in need of a remake? I will say Girls Night Out from, I don't know, it's probably 84, 86. N-I-T-E Night. And I, yeah. I know that I hate that. I hate that it's spelled N-I-T-E. It's like, are you going to do the, the dot in the I with a happy face or what's going on? But um, Girls Night Out is a really good story build. It's not executed that well. It's got a killer. Is that a mascot slasher? It's a mascot. He's yeah. in a bear mascot and he has these whirly gig eyes and he puts steak knives in his claws and his hands so he has, yeah. he has, I think it's 82 maybe when it came out and it's really pretty good and it's got to have the same title but I would hope they would spell night right because that bugs me to no end. <laughs> Um, I don't want anyone to ever remake it, but if anyone remade it, it would make so much sense to remake it. Chopping Mall. Oh, yeah. 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 With the killer robots. Yeah. No, we need an update on that. I think yeah. you're right. Um, okay. Are we going to do audience questions? Yeah, we got a bunch online. 
Was okay, we got online questions, and you guys, I think there are mics there. You can ask questions. Um, yeah. I think, how does the audience questions work? So the work? easiest way to do audience questions, we have mics on either side of the forum. One's there and one's right there. Just run and grab it. Or just, just walk up to it, don't grab it. <laughs> or yeah, or you could just walk up to it. <laughs> grab it, grab it. We have a bunch online, so okay. we have people from all over the place. Uh, we got folks in the UK, we got people in Michigan, Florida, including Jessica Guest, which is one yeah. of my favorite writers. I know, hey, Jessica. Jessica. Um, okay, let's start with a question from students at Interlochen Center for the Arts. They're reading The Bird is Gone from one of their classes. Stephen, how did you balance so many narratives in one piece? It wasn't easy. That book melted my brain. When I turned it in, the publisher, the person doing the layout for that book quit. We had to buy her vodka and roses to come back because she didn't like to format that book. But that's kind of how my brain works. My brain works in this stupid way that Bird is Gone is put together. And I shouldn't say stupid about my own stuff, I know. But um, it, does, it, it makes sense to me. I'm not sure it makes sense to everybody else. But it came out like that. I, it's, it, it's easy to take that book as a quilt stitched together from other failures. But to tell you the truth, I wrote that book just as it appears. Hi, Hi. I'm Judy. And my question is for Stephen. I am listening to My Heart is a Chainsaw right now on audio. I'm finding it difficult to keep track of on audio. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you would ever consider doing an appendix or an annotated version with all of the horror references that you used. Because you know, I feel like I thought I knew a lot about horror until I started listening to this book. And there's so many things I've missed, like chop, Cropsy. Yeah, Cropsy. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's two people on Letterboxd, at least, who have compiled all the movies that are mentioned or obliquely referenced in My Heart is a Chainsaw, and I don't think those lists match up either. Maybe if you add those two lists together, like each list has about 150, 170 titles. I think if you add those two lists together and cancel out the comments, or let, then you would have a complete list of everything. Where is this? Letterboxd, the I site. Uh, I, don't, I don't use it. Letterboxd. It's sort of like a, a more easy to use hipster version of IMDB, yeah. and oh. it's just letterbox with a D at the end of it, dot okay. com. And the search function is really useful. If you go in and put my heart as a chainsaw on the search function, it'll bring up people's lists that okay. they put together, and this will be right at the top. Mm -hmm. And just one more thing. Manx, is that a reference to Nosferatu? Well, I do like Nosferatu a lot, so kind of, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for Grady from AA, which paperback from hell should be made into a movie immediately, Ooh. and who should write and direct it? Wow. Oh, that's so easy. Well, there's two, actually. Um, I don't know about writing and direct. Oh, yeah, I do. OK. Uh, the first is William Johnson's Toy Cemetery. Um, William W. Johnstone was absolutely out of his mind. He mostly wrote Westerns. He wrote hundreds of Westerns. And when I did paperbacks from hell, uh, Penguin Ran I, my publisher was Quirk, but Penguin Random House was our distributor. And so we were a little thinking about rights issues. And so um, Jason went to, my editor went to Penguin Random House and talked to him and be like, oh, we're doing this book and you know, it's all this stuff, but we want to make sure you guys are okay with us reproducing covers. We know you're not legal, but are you going to come after us? And they're like, no, no. And they're flipping through and one of them goes, holy crap, William Johnstone. And they're like, he is one of our, still to this day, one of our top 100 selling authors in all of Penguin Random House, because he wrote these like hundreds of Westerns that are sold at drug stores all over the Northwest and the Southwest, and still truckers and like everyone buys these things still. But William Johnstone's Toy Cemetery, here's the brief version. A guy goes back to his hometown in Missouri with his daughter, and the town's been taken over by Satanists out of an evil toy factory uh, run by an obese pedophile named Bruno Dixon, but also living toys are living in his old family home, the veterans, and they have to help the toys fight the evil toys. But then also there's an underground research facility with the products of incest in it. And the products of incest are eight foot tall monsters with apple sized heads. And at night, the scientists let them out to run around town to work off their energy. But if they see a tourist, they usually kill the tourists and like smash their car. And at one point, they stop a clock in order to freeze time. There are like hatchet murders, kung fu. It's got ghost werewolves in it that can only be killed with a silver stake through the heart. It's amazingly <laughs> ridiculous. It, it, and I want it. I want. I want to write it. And I want. Um, uh, 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 what's the guy who did The Incredibles? Um, Brad Bird to direct it because I want it to be a Pixar movie and I want it to come out and I want parents to take their children so they can answer going, Mommy, what did we just see? 
And then the other one I was going to say was William Sleater's Among the Dolls, which is very similar. I it's, feel like you may have answered this, but what's the best horror movie to watch stoned? And the best horror movie to watch stoned? Oh, boy, man. Um, I, so I'm pretty chill when I'm stoned. So I, and I don't like movies I like. I don't like to rewatch anything I like stoned because I'll be like, I'll just hate on it. So um, I would say A Field in England, the Ben Wheatley uh, British Civil War movie set in I think the 17th century or 18th century uh, that's very like psychedelic. Stephen, uh, I'm supposed to answer, I think something animated probably. Mm. Um, Spine of Night? Spine of Night just came out like two days, or yesterday it came out. I think that would be a good one, probably. It's trippy in a lot of ways. Uh, Stacy would love to know how the two authors feel about the 2018 Suspiria remake, especially since their opinions are split about Argento's. <laughs> I didn't get through it. I watched about 10 minutes of it, and I realized this movie was not for me, so I dove out. It may be great. I don't know. I saw that the movie got a giant 12-page article in The New Yorker and immediately realized it probably wasn't for me, so I never watched it. <laughs> Lynn asks, what trends or directions do you see horror going in the next five to ten years? Man, if we could figure that out, right? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'm not going to tell. <laughs> You're going to steal it if I say it. Um, I don't know. I just honestly don't know. Like, are we going to be into mummies? Maybe we'll be into mummies or mermaids. Selkies? Yeah, selkies. Those are always fun. Um, I'm going to guess haunted houses. I think haunted houses might come big. And you've got a haunted house novel coming out next year. Thank God. Yep. Thank God you said this, yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, to me, one of the best things that's happened in publishing, period, full stop, and I would say the past 50 years, is there's this push for diversity. Uh, black authors, trans authors, just non-white authors, uh, non-cis authors, uh, non-male authors, even though a lot of women are already right, but a real push. And I think that's huge because, you know, it, it's interesting. I read someone, I read a trans author's body horror book um, that was self-published, and it was, I never could have thought my way into this. You know, it was amazing. Um, and, and I just think we're getting better stories. Like, I, if I want to hear a white guy, man, I'll talk to myself. Um, you know, I want to hear all this stuff, and the stories seem to be pretty fucking good so far. So that's what I think the future of horror is. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nathan. I just wanted to, uh, well, I want to ask a question, but first I wanted to say you guys missed best slasher, Dr. Morgan from Last Man on Earth. He didn't even know he was killing off the human race. And oh. he thought he was doing what was good. <laughs> in <my> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if I've um, seen it. But, Graham? Just want to say, we, you've mentioned Uncle Sleazy a lot. We're all really worried about you right now. Uh, this evening when you were making comments about, uh, yeah. Oh, me. Yeah. Oh, Grady. Yeah. Grady. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Grady. No worries. Too many drinks. Um, <laughs> no, I hear you. Um, you know, you mentioned Uncle Sleazy a lot tonight. We're all very worried about you. But well, Steven, <laughs> Freddy Krueger, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, Stephen, I just wanted to ask, uh, why are ghosts not a part of your ideal haunting experience, you know, they, or the uh, horror experience. You aren't a ghost guy. I'm not a ghost guy, no. It, it is just because I see ghosts as largely being expositional devices. They're a way that the writer pours information into the story. And, like, once they said their piece, they just blip out into another room, and we may not see them for a long time. I think they're kind of cheap. I've, I've done, I, did, I wanted to explore it, though. So I wrote this novella, Mapping the Interior, and in that one, I had a ghost who, he starts out kind of spectral, but the more, like, I don't know, life force, kind of like the Toby Hooper movie, that he sucks from people, he can claw his way back to the physical. And that, to me, was a little bit scary. But, yeah, a ghost that you can pass your hand through, I just don't know, all they can do is tell you stuff, so they're just not scary to me. All I've got to say, mm -hmm. toy cemetery, ghost werewolf. <laughs> yeah, man. That'll you change your mind. All right. You guys good for a few more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, it's hot up here, so you... It is right attire. Um, I'm not feeling the heat. <laughs> uh, Kelly asks, do either of you have a favorite scary song for the season? Song. A song. I consider Dragula to be kind of scary. Rob Zombie's Dragula. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of horror songs out there. Mm -hmm. I, gotta, I gotta say, okay, so I was just doing book tour stuff in the Midwest. And um, I was driving everywhere. So I was doing like long night drives. And I was in Iowa. And I was listening to my playlist. And uh, the soundtrack from the original Suspiria came on. 
and it's unnerving when you're by yourself out in the cornfield. So yeah, I would say anything from Goblin's Suspiria album, any of the first four songs. All right, for both of you, if you could write a novel or a screenplay for a slasher franchise, which franchise would you choose and why? A novel or a screenplay for a slasher franchise? I think Final Destination or Scream for me. Probably, probably Final Destination. Oh, Leprechaun. 100% <laughs> I do Leprechaun. Oh, this is a good one. If you had to pick one of the other's books to be turned into a movie, which book of theirs would you pick? Easy, Mongrels. Uh, mm. I think My Best Friend's Exorcism. What did you think about Creepshow? Also, why does uh, humor work so well in horror? Creepshow, the, the series movie? or the movie? We don't know. I'm going to say the series. The series? No, it's fun. It kind of recreated the ethos of the show, I thought. I actually didn't see the series. Yeah. But I like the movie a lot. Yeah. Although, the, when you watch the, when you go back to, is it Creepshow 2? And watch Stephen King's The Raft. The Raft. That's like a really rapey version of The Raft. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? <laughs> like. Yeah. Although I gotta say, the raft is one of the most disturbing short stories ever. So like good. reading it, it's so yeah. hopeless and bleak. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like it a lot. Um, what was the question? I forgot the question already. Creep show the series. Oh you? yeah, yeah. I thought it was it was cool. And then why does humor work so well in horror? Because we need to reset. I think it acts as a pressure release valve, so that horror doesn't plateau at a scream. Humor, jokes, comedy, whatever it is, allows us to go back down, so that we can climb the terror ladder again. Let's see. Um, any thoughts on The Ring and The Grudge? Yeah, they're amazing. Um, and I'll take the originals over the remakes. Really? Nothing wrong with Gore Verbinski's Ring remake, yeah. Yeah. but the original is incredible. And the original Juwan movies are amazing, amazing nonlinear freak shows. They are. They're terrifying. They, they, they have some sticky imagery in them. Yeah. I kind of like that the um, Naomi Watts... The ring, though. That, that oh, yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I just feel like they're so different to me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, the original ring doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. quite all add. Mm -hmm. There's more exposition with Naomi Watts's. Mm -hmm. Very curious to hear both of your, thought, your thoughts on horror from other countries. Is there an underrated novel or movie from someplace else that should be on everyone's radar? I guess it's more of a thriller. Have you seen No Mercy? No, no what's that? No Mercy is brutal. It is... I don't, I don't want to spoil it if y'all want to be traumatized, but No Mercy is pretty pretty solid. I think it's Korean. No Mercy. Where's it? What year? Do you remember? I don't. I would guess like 03 if I had to yeah. guess. So I'm I'm big on. Um, I ran an Asian film festival for a long time, and so I love this stuff. So I mean, if you want to go back to the original, like Mr. Vampire, the original Hopping Vampire movie, it's still great. Um, there were a bunch of really crunky Category 3, which is sort of the Hong Kong NC-17 movies that came out in the early 90s. Um, Dr. Lamb, Red to Kill, Run and Kill that are absolutely incredible. Um, one of the best movies about sexual politics I've ever seen is uh, Billy Tang's uh, Red to Kill about a necrophiliac serial rapist stalking a home for developmentally disabled adults. It sounds so tasteless, and it absolutely is, but it has incredibly great gender politics in it. Um, but I would say if something's un, un, underappreciated, um, it's on a bunch of streaming services right now, um, but the Korean movie, um, it's not called Bewitched. It's, um, uh, I can't remember the name. Um, and it's just escaping me right now. Um, did you see do the women, they go back to their hometown, it's on an island? No, I don't know. Uh, that. Uh, yeah. um, but the other thing that's extremely underrated in terms of books, anything by Junji Ito. Uh, yeah, he's I a agree. Japanese manga okay. artist. Uh, avoid Frankenstein, but Uzumaki, any of his short stories are the most disturbing things you will ever see in your life. And while you're at it, get your local library to get you a copy of uh, Kazuo Umezu's Drifting Classroom. Yeah. He's another manga artist. Yeah. And it's just about an elementary school classroom that suddenly transports to this terrible wasteland. And it goes into the most David Lynch, bizarre, surreal, Lord of the Flies situation you'll and ever see. And it goes for volume after volume, doesn't it's it? It's like 20 volumes, yeah. yeah. But you're the one who turned me on to Junji Ito a while back, and I'm so thankful for that. You know, I would also add Blood Quantum, Jeff Barnaby's. It's, oh, uh, it's yeah, a yeah. zombie movie set on a Canadian reserve, and it is so well told, so well done. It wasn't no, the wailing. No, it's not the wailing. The wailing I like, but no, I'm going to try to think of this later. 
All right, one more uh, from the audience. We have favorite horror book cover. Book cover. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I know what mine is. I think it for me. I like it. For me, it's uh, Graham Masterton's Feast. Uh, which is like a skull, and you see little screaming children in one eye, and you open it, it's like a die cut, and the step back art is all these skeletons, and they're cooking these children in this giant cauldron, like their soup, and it has nothing to do with the book, but you're just like, this is the most metal thing I've ever seen in my yes. life. You know, when I say it, I should say, the, I think it's the original cover that shows the gutter and the little, With the little claw yeah. hand? Yeah, 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 the yeah. little like, reptile hand. It's very it. subtle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, a couple of people, Lynn and Jessica, say, is it bedeviled? Bedeviled. Oh, that's Thank, Thank you. you guys. Yes, it's on every screen, streaming, screaming, every streaming service, uh, every streaming service, bedeviled. Oh, these people are geniuses. I love the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but it is great. It's basically, uh, or a, why do I always say it's basically? It is the story of a, um, that's like when the waiter comes to the table and he's like, this will be your, uh, you know, tabbouleh. I'm like, no, it is. It is. It's not going to turn into that. Um, but but a begrudge is, is a woman who's a bank clerk uh, on sort of the corporate track, and she's a real hard ass, and no one likes her. And she kind of like, they're like, you need to take a vacation because you've just put your foot in it and ticked everyone off. So she goes back to her hometown, which is this rural hellscape village in the middle of nowhere where basically everyone works hard in the fields all day and the women are just exist to serve the men who are just drunks who like rule the roost and you find out that she and her best friend were supposed to escape this town together in high school and she left her best friend behind and just took care of herself and there's a lot of grudges that get settled it's phenomenal and then just last question do you guys what's next up for you guys what are you working on next anything you can talk about I'm going to put on looser pants next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to get this eye makeup off. Perfect. But um, coming out, you mean? Books coming yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah, I've got Don't Fear the Reaper, the sequel to My Heart is a Chainsaw, out in July of 22. And I have a haunted house novel coming out before that, probably in the spring. Wait, you've got a haunted house out? Jesus Christ. <laughs> before mine. So I've got a book coming out in December that's nonfiction called These Fists Break Bricks. That's the history of kung fu movies coming to America. And my co-author, Chris Bajali, who's an insane researcher, we went deep. We found everything from CIA-backed karate movies that were trying to draw out communists in the Japanese film industry to an 11-year-old boy who made a global blockbuster movie um, to just some of the most bizarre and weird stories you'll ever read. Um, and a lot about Chuck Norris. I know more about Chuck Norris than I ever wanted to now. Um, and then next summer, I've got my next novel, How to Sell a Haunted House, which takes place in January of 2021, and it's about brothers and sisters and evil puppets. Fantastic. Thank you both so much, Grady, Stephen. This was awesome. No, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, for everybody here at the library, uh, we're going to give them a second to breathe, and then we will do a book signing at the table on this side of the forum. Uh, and for everybody at home, thank you so much for watching and for, for uh, being so cool in the chat and, and the Q&A. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe, and happy Story Fest. Woo.